Hello, welcome to Agile Actually, episode three. Three, uh, yeah. Oh, Revenge of the Sith, right? Um, <laughs> so today, Martin and I wanted to explore something that was bubbling up, and it's why words matter. Yeah. And there's a, a few things have been rattling around social media, Martin. What? Talk to me about that. What's got your goose? Well, well, the, the thing that's actually got the main one that's got my goose, which has got my goose every time it comes up and people bring it up all the time, is the immutability of the Scrum Guide. Um, and I always, always have the same reply. And it's the same. It's funnily enough, it's the same people that keep bringing up. So I'm not sure if they're they're just doing it deliberately to bait people. Right. Um, but it certainly it certainly baits me for sure. Um, just that 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 reality that it the the immutability that it talks about in the Scrum Guide is the language specifically says that it's okay to do whatever the heck you want with Scrum. Yeah, like that's part of that whole paragraph is you can do whatever you want with Scrum, but if you're not implementing it like it says here, then it's probably best to call it something else because you're not doing this thing because this thing is described in here. That's, that's, that... that's, that's the whole point, right? If you, um, if you're using the framework in its entirety, it is scrum. Yeah. And that's what Jeff and Ken are really calling out. I've got a metaphor that I use when people start arguing about this or getting upset about this. Uh, if I have a piece of dough and I stretch it out flat and I put a sauce and some toppings on it and bake it, it's a pizza, right? Now, if I fold it over and then bake it, it's now a calzone. And you yeah. can't call a calzone a pizza, right? That's just not on. Now, I'm not going to get into the hotter topic of whether it's okay to put pineapple on a pizza. Yeah, that's a whole other problem. That's a whole other problem. <laughs> that's a, again, uh, you know, um, it, is, it is, but that's a whole other problem. Well, it, it's a personal choice thing. Like, I've got yeah, no yeah. preference. You put on top of a pizza whatever you want to eat, mate. But, you know, <laughs> I don't care. You're going to eat it. <laughs> my, my local store here, Simon, does does haggis pizza. Oh, that would be good. It's um, actually not. And ho hopefully I can, uh, that's just triggered a whole bunch of folks out on the interweb like Googling haggis. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but, but I think that this, this, this idea, people, people latch on to, especially when they want to argue, right? They latch on to particular wording in the Scrum Guide and say, well, Scrum says this, so it means this other thing, but they're not taking in the wider context. The words in the Scrum Guide don't exist in on their own. They exist within the context of the whole document, which gives meaning and changes the meaning of certain ways of saying things because it's caveated or quantified. So the context of the words matters, right? Because the it's words in the context of the Scrum Guide yep. gives them extra resonance and value. And... It's an important part of communication and culture, the way we use our words and how we use our words will give them resonance, which comes into something we'd like to talk about later on. But words have power. Yeah, and I think in in we have understandings of meanings of words in order to be able to communicate more effectively, right? I mean, w one of the reasons that we, we as, as, as species, uh, ironed out those, those, those words um, and said, you know, this is what they mean just now. It can change over time, right? The meaning can change yep. slowly over time. That's, that's just fine. Um, but at the moment, this word means this thing until a good bunch of us agree differently. It enables us not not to have fights over stuff, right? That's how wars have been started because of the way words have meaning. And if we don't understand the same thing, certainly certainly fights in my household have been conducted 
um, because people might use words, I might use words that mean something different to somebody else, right? Oh, and completely. It's vocabulary. Having a common shared vocabulary allows us to communicate. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. Um, so, so, but that's one of the reasons that the the Scrum Guide does have different. It, it the Scrum Guide is twenty twenty five thirty years old. Thirty years old now. Well, the Scrum Guide. Speaking, well, technically speaking, the Scrum is twenty three years old. The first recorded example of the Scrum Guide was 2009 on the Scrum Alliance website before Ken left. Yeah. So it started iterating at that point. Now, prior to that, the the reference article for Scrum was Ken's book. The book that he wrote with Mike Beadle very, very early on. Unfortunately, um, Mike tragically left us very early. Um, so that was where it was canonically put down and the the communication of what the scrum framework was was conducted through csm courses because at that time the scrum alliance was the sole certifying body so yeah. scrum's been around and i think that helped its evolution and growth but also uh hindered it a little because you have a lot of folks who've been doing agile for a while uh and they they don't or have not caught up with the scrum guide. I can remember being on a course, um, very, very respected, uh, awesome person. Uh, and it was with Lisa Adkins as I was doing her coaching course, her three day coaching course and her two day facilitation course. And she kept using the language of ceremonies. And that, that word triggers me. <laughs> That's a trigger word for me, not events. And it, it was interesting because we're, I, I had to suppress it and she said, I can see you flinch every time I use that word. Why is it? And it's like, well, a ceremony has a different intent to event. Yep. You know, there's a number of ceremonies that I've been to or witnessed that it's it's all pomp and circumstance, right? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. It doesn't actually have to have a viable outcome. And many ceremonies you can't leave early. Um, so for a while I went to boarding school and, you know, every Sunday morning we went to mass and I'm pretty sure it was about the only way that you could, they could keep an eye on the whole school one time because they knew for that one hour and 45 minutes, we were all at mass and they didn't have to worry about what this bunch of teenagers were up to. So, uh, yeah, so words matter. Words are incredibly important. They're necessary for transparency. Yep. And they're there for communication and context is everything. So is it okay to say that we need jargon? Is jargon acceptable? But I think, I think jargon brings transparency within a context, but it also brings opacity outside of that context, right? If you when when uh, you're probably the same as me when you first start working with a with a new customer, um, they'll they they come with their own reams of jargon for for words and phrases and acronyms that they use within the organization that they say very quickly, right? Because maybe it's a long thing that they've shortened, and they need they 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 they, they want to aid communication and transparency within their context. But it makes it very difficult, creates a barrier for for those of us trying to trying to get in and understand what's what's going on. But I think that's always been true, right? Oh, um, sure. Yeah, I I see that there's two aspects of it. First of all, you'll you'll end up uh, industries have jargon. Yep. And then organisations will have their own jargon, and you mush those two together, and you get lots of jargon and. I think jargon is a linguistic shorthand for a complex term. Yep. That's that's how I that's how my brain breaks it down basically. And a number of times I've gone into a new client, new customer, and they use the term sprint. And sprint to you and I as professional scrum trainers, as professional scrum people, sprint is part of the reserve vocabulary. And yep. also because we're both specific. Yeah, well, because like you're still a more active software engineer than I am. I can still read code, but it's been a long time since I cut some. 
you can't go into a programming language and repurpose any of the reserved words of the programming language. No, it won't let you. No, well, it, your code won't work, right? It, it's, it'll give you a syntax error. It will not compile or interpret down to an achievable outcome. I have a similar level of <laughs> confusion when people use the word, oh, we're doing two week sprints. Oh, oh, what do you do after that? Oh, well, then, well, we have an analysis sprint and then we have a design sprint. And uh, I always think of the Princess Bride and that wonderful quote. I don't think that word means what you think it what does. Think it means. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, words, words matter. It's so, especially it worth... when, 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 when you as an organization or as a team say that Scrum is part of your context, that then brings in imports a bunch of those reserved words that mean very specific things. And the Scrum Guide is very specific about. What is a product owner? What's the, the 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 scope and variability of a product owner? The scope and variability of a scrum master, of developers, right? Of yep. what is a product backlog? All of those things are very specific. And if we try and overload them and use them to mean something else, then we lose a certain level of transparency, especially when we are interacting with people who are outside of our organization who might have their own they've they've they even worse that they've overloaded it as well and it means something else to them right that's something that i see a lot in in organizations especially professional services organizations yeah where you've got their their internal overloaded term of what's a scrum master right a jira admin right but what's a scrum master and then the customer has their own one and when people go look it up, there's that third one in the middle, which is the one that mentioned in the Scrum Guide. And they're trying to engage and communicate on the same level. And they're quite often just talking different languages. Yeah, and it, it creates confusion. It, it generates dissonance. Uh, you end up with people talking past each other, right? Yep, yep. Um, and this is where you, you end up... Even within English, you get dialects like the UK is fascinating because you travel 20 miles, you get a different dialect. Yep. And sometimes the syntax changes the, um, so my wife's Welsh and there's some really funny, um, Welshisms and it causes confusion. My, uh, one of the favorites is I'll do it now in a minute. I do. No, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, is it now or is it in a minute? Which is it? Oh, well, it's, it's, it's basically it's a way of saying I'll do it shortly. Well, uh, see, si, pero no. Right, we've got that's, that's 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 an expression that that both my wife and I share. In Spanish, it's yes, but no, and in Scotland, we have an expression I but no. Right, and it just 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 means well maybe, right? It just means yeah. maybe. Yeah, 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 yeah. There's some variability in it, but you would have had a conversation between you and your wife that that built it up, yeah, and now now it's part of the lexicon, right? Because you've built that common understanding, and so um, I think to get back to what triggered you on it, I think people try and hit on the immutability of Scrum. It's my personal opinion. It's cheap troll bait on the interweb. Um, and it, it reminds me of a, a tweet recently I saw from uh, somebody somewhere else on social media put it and Hayley Mathers, Eminem's daughter, put out a tweet. There's somebody had put out a, an album uh, dissing on Eminem and she said, my dad's so famous that people have to put a diss album on him just to get some sort of recognition. <laughs> you know, it's, a, it's that same sort of thing is to to get myself to boost myself to boost the clicks and the likes and what have you i'm just gonna jump on the scrum hate train or you know kanban's yeah. horrible because of this or scrum uh, or you know let, let's bash something some framework or other and like every framework has got merits within context uh you know with, everyone's got their favorite um whatever 
but if we use terms, if we're, if we're clear on them, at least we know what we're arguing about. Yep. Is, is I suppose where I'm getting with that. And sometimes folks will just riff on things because they, they just, you know, looking for a bit of a click. Well, that's kind and, of that's kind of the purpose of the, the, the word immutability there. I mean, I, if if I was rewriting that part today with all the people using it in the way that they use it, I might write it differently, but I would want the same intent. Right? The intent of I, I just got it up here that the Scrum framework as outlined herein is immutable. Right? While implementing only parts of Scrum is possible, the result is not Scrum. That's yeah, you fold the pizza over, it's a calzone. Yeah. I my my favorite example of, of doing doing this well um was the, the ALM Rangers at Microsoft. Mm -hmm. uh, they were a kind of loose group of people who worked together in kind of loose sprints, in kind of loose teams. And uh, they had, you know, and they didn't have dailies. They had weeklies because they operated over longer timescales because everybody was volunteers. And they decided, no, you know, they even have it in their documentation. They said, we decided we couldn't use the word Scrum because it just didn't represent what it was we were doing. So we're going to use the word rock. And they called it a rock, which is another rugby term. And they defined it as a loose Scrum is the way they defined it. Right, we're 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 doing a little bit of scrum, but we're not really doing all of the things the way it says because we have other considerations that we have to take into account, and and that for me is the quintessential outcome of what this means is that if if you're doing scrum, call it scrum. If you're not doing scrum, have your own name for it for the thing that yeah. you're doing that that we're inheriting from scrum, and we're implementing our own thing within that space and they don't have to be the same thing. I, I, I always feel that that it's it both the phrasing in the end note and phrasing earlier in the guide leads you to think, I don't have to do everything here. I don't have to do it the way it says here. Again, it's the Scrum guide, not the Scrum rule book, right? Um, well, we can do whatever we want. Just don't tell fibs and tell people you're doing scrum when you're not to keep it transparent right yeah and I, I think that's a a trap for the unwary is to get sucked into a mechanical execution of a framework or process and you can almost see it where some folks think that to do scrum well you have to become like the process fastest um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's like this um as opposed to understanding empiricism, living the scrum values, building feedback loops, deliver, get some feedback, do some learning, deliver, deliver, deliver. You know, yeah. if, if I had a magic wand, every time I go into the client, if, if I could wave it and get them to done within two weeks so that they could actually get something out, I would be that's the magic wand, right? And this is what I think helping people understand what done is and then the other big challenge is scrum doesn't fix your problems it reveals them i love that phrase so i i i i um i read it again recently i i'd heard it years before but i'd forgotten scrum is a mirror that yep. was that was that phrasing scrum is a mirror it's going it's going to show you when 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 you can't do things that we think are a good idea to be able to successfully build high quality products, when you can't do those things, it's like looking in a mirror. Well, well, Scrum's just reflecting back to you the things you can't do, the things that are difficult, the things that are, are, are maybe deficiencies in your, in your solution or your problem or your way you're doing. Yeah. And this sort of ties into the other vocabulary polemic or the other great clickbait is um, Scrum's horrible, do Kanban, Scrum versus Kanban, Kanban well, versus Scrum. Scrum. Scrum's got too many, too many components. We should just do Kanban instead, Simon. Okay. That's, that's, we, could, we can just have a, we, we'll have a board on the wall and we'll move our stickies across it and we're good. We don't need anything I, else. So 
are you going to use whip limits? What are those? Are, are you, how are you using your metrics? Uh, will you tap into work? Well, we, we don't need metrics. That's too totalitarian. Oh, okay. So you're going to traverse from doing scrum poorly to doing Kanban ineffectually. And then well, you're going to end I'm up saying that. Kanban not at all either, right? <laughs> well, it's not. It's, it's, it's visualization light. <laughs> it's certainly not a work limited pool system, right? Unless, exactly. Unless and you're limiting whip and you're pulling something, right? That's the. It, it, yeah, it's, it's that, that Scrum uh, V's Kanban. I see that a lot as. And again, it's a it's a clickbait. It's a clickbait thing. They're trying to trying to pull people in. They're trying to pull the the Scrum uh, uh, proponents in, the Kanban proponents, the 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 those disenfranchised with either, um, and try and do some kind of comparison. And I and I find largely all of the comparisons are just BS, right? Yeah. The the they usually describe Scrum poorly, they describe Kanban poorly, and they describe the intersection really poorly. Um. I, I think you and I are unanimous in the opinion that it doesn't matter whether you start with Scrum or Kanban, you can apply aspects. So you, you can actually run both of them on top of each other. And I would, I think you, uh, I, I think we're both aligned in the fact that really effective teams will be using both on top of each other. So they're getting yeah, I, I, the pool base, they're getting work item aging, the metrics, all of that good stuff, the events I, and the cyclic nature. I kind of, I kind of, uh, somebody else used this phrasing and terminology. I've kind of adopted it. I'm not sure it's totally correct, but I, I, I think of Scrum as a social technology, right? It, it's a thing that was created in order to help people work together effectively. Yep. It doesn't have any metrics. It doesn't have uh, 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 any of those things that we could use to optimize. It just says you need to. You, you need to be as an effective a team as possible. It doesn't tell you how to do that. And I think K Kanban brings in a lot of those those metrics that we can use to figure out where our problems are. Uh, 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 you know, once we once we've dealt with the big problem, right? Which is, you know, oh, there's there's why can't you deliver every four weeks? You can only deliver every six weeks. What, what, what's the problem, right? So that's that's the yeah, mirror yeah. that some holds up that that social technology of working together more effectively. Once we've dealt with those problems and we're kind of within the bounds of this thing where we're moving along, how, how do we then start optimizing at, at, at a smaller level, at a, a at a more consistent level? And that's when we're then starting to bring in those those flow tools, right? How can we learn? Yeah. How can we? adapt it's not about the inspection it's about the adaptation right exactly exactly um and i think i think it's one of these things that it it they they work perfectly together they are not antagonistic at all i think the reason that people think of it as antagonistic is because when they say scrum v's kanban they don't actually mean scrum but v's kanban they mean scrum v's kanban method Right, and the Kanban method for me is something different from core Kanban. Kanban method has a whole bunch of uh, uh, rules and just like Scrum does, right? Has a whole bunch of uh, uh, rules and um, events and things that happen within its story in order to have a total system. You know, I would even go so far. I, I and I think I've said this before. Kanban's a meta process. It's not a process in itself, right? It's it's the thing that allows you to observe the thing and improve the thing. But you have to have a thing in the first place. So yeah. if your thing if your thing is not Scrum, what is your thing? Oh, we're doing Kanban. No, you're not. Kanban is for observing what you are doing. What are you doing? And what they're really doing is they make up make it up as they go along, right? Well, that that um, process fluidity. It's it's very <laughs> That's tricky. That's a polite way to say make it up as you go along, Simon. Yeah, um, organizations have adapted so they they're functioning in some way or another, right? And yeah, it's interesting. It's very large clients. It's really important to nail it down and say, well, okay, 
what will our reserve language be? What do we mean? When we use this word, what do we mean? When we say scrum, what does it mean? When we say Kanban, what does it mean? If it, it brings me to the next uh, poke, I'll poke the bear now. Um, done versus ready. It's yeah. another one I see. <laughs> it's it, it's that, uh, a that's permanent. a trigger one for me as well. Is it trigger for you, Ross? Uh, Simon, sorry. That's right. Uh, yes, because a number of people like ready can be helpful, but it isn't in the Scrum Guide. And this is the whole thing: is you can put whatever you like on top of Scrum. It's a framework, right? It's, it's you can put whatever other practices and techniques you need to put on top of it. And if you scale, you're certainly going to have to add loads of stuff on just to get it to work because scaling is hard. Um, I find most people who jump to tightening up ready haven't really nailed done yet. Yeah. It, I think it's, it's easier. It's easier to think of a definition of ready than it is to think of a definition of done. But for me, there's a more dangerous, I think, undertone between done and ready. The, Go on. The, so that done is something that is measurable. It's a Boolean proposition. It's either done, it either meets the quality bar or it doesn't. It's either shippable or it's not, right? Yep. Ready encapsulates everybody's understanding of the thing. I, I've never seen a short measurable checklist that can encapsulate ready for both the product owner, the, the, the developers and the stakeholders all understanding something. It's not something that's quantifiable. So that's the, the first issue that I have with ready is that, what well, I've no, no problem with ready, but a definition of ready is that it's not a definition of ready. It's a definition of candidacy for ready, right? It's almost like, pre-ready stuff that we need in order to then start having the right conversations. Um, oh, but a, I think an, an interesting take. Uh, the way I've seen ready years and the way I'm more comfortable with it, the team have got enough confidence that they can finish it in a sprint. Simple as that. Yeah. You reckon you can get this done in a sprint? Yeah, well, it's ready. And then there might be some guidelines around it, but I'm, I'm sort of with you. When people start coming out with the 28 bullet point checklist of ready, <laughs> um, that's automatically calculated in your tool of choice. You know, somebody's done a whole lot of work in Jira or Azure DevOps or target process <laughs> or, you know, name your favorite, um, that these fields have got more than 400 words in it. This has got three documents attached to it. It's got two Visio diagrams, one PowerPoint. Um, it's been blessed by eight people, nine ways till Sunday. <laughs> it, it, then you're missing a trick. You've become bureaucratic and you're, you're falling into some old, old school behaviors of plausible deniability and trying to get that perfect requirement. There's no such thing. As I build it, I'm going to need some feedback and there's then it's complex what we're doing. And because it's complex, I need the opportunity to check in with you as we're doing it. Well, that, that's where I would also add, a, a, there's a, for me, there's a second level of danger. That was just the yellow light. There's a red light as well for, for definition of, it's very specifically definition of ready. I do yep. agree with you that when ready becomes a big checklist, you've probably got a problem. But if we, put ready and done at the same level, I think it diminishes done. No. Oh. Done is a far more important concept than ready is. Far more. That's why it has explicitly a definition of ready in the Scrum Guide, because that's important. If we mess up ready and we don't quite understand it, but we get to done, we can reflect on what we've created. We can we can we can say to the oh no, we didn't mean that at all. 
no, you've gone down completely the wrong route. Let's figure out how we get to the right route, right? Yep. But you can't do that if you don't have done. So I, I feel like having a definition, the, using the phrase definition of ready, and it, it belittles, belittles, that might not be the right word, diminishes the definition of done. I'm, what, are the, what I'm hearing you describe is that it undermines the definition of done. That's probably a better word. You're more um, eloquent than me. We, we need that clear point, that, that launch point. Once it's done, it can go. Ready means we're good enough. We know the sense of travel, the direction we're going in, the, what we need to do to get it delivered. And when we have a loose, ambiguous, vague definition of done that is unattainable within a sprint, then there's a whole world of pain for us. Yeah. Because we don't know when to stop. We'll just keep building, right? Why haven't you given that to the customer? Oh, well, you know. It's not ready yet. <laughs> See, I just use ready in a different different context. That's, yeah. I, I think, I think we're, 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 we seem to definitely be on the same page for, I mean, we've talked about transparency, jargon, um, Scrum V's Kanban, Done V's Ready. I mean, this is all kind of around that same topic of why words matter. Um, but then we bring in the context of multicultural <laughs> conversations. And got a couple of funny I, stories about that. <laughs> I, well, I would even point out that your English is different from my English. I grew up in Scotland and live in Scotland. You grew up in Australia and live in London. Well, England, yeah. There's, Close there's more. To, there's more to England than London, mate. Stop being so Scots. That's not what the map is. <laughs> no, it's it's not what Westminster thinks. But um, yeah, there's coming over. Uh, well, even travelling within Australia, if you move from the far north where I grew up, I grew up in far north Queensland and slid down, um, finished my bachelor's degree in Brisbane, yeah. and th then from there went to Melbourne. Um, so yeah, there's very a lexicons. Very different um, styles. There are things that are ubiquitous. Uh, interesting things happen in English, where you know your product names become uh, the reference to the product. Uh, sure, I need a, I need a clean act because there's a lot of pollen, and I need to hoover the floor. Yeah. Yeah, and you're probably using a shark or a Dyson to hoover the floor, right? I'm gonna I'm gonna write in the wall with my Sharpie. Uh, exactly. It's just a, a felt pen. Uh, yeah. the, the the one you pants, you know, uh in Australia, pants are the outer garment. What you wear yeah. underneath them are called underpants. Oh, right. Okay, because they go under your pants. Yeah. Whereas yeah. uh, in the UK, they're not. The funniest one and the one you've got to be very careful of, uh, in Australia, the very typical footwear in warmer climates is called a thong. Um, also known as a flip-flop in the UK, a thong in the UK is a G-string, a piece of underwear. Yep. <laughs> so, have you seen my thong takes on a completely different... It's a completely different meaning, right? Very yeah, different context, and but I think I think one of the 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 the, the difficulties is that in English is spoken all over the world. There are many countries around the world where English is their first language. Some of them it's based on American English, and some of it's based on British English. Yep. and which has slightly different meanings for things, and certainly slightly different cultural connotation. You you, you don't really know the difference between um, Amer American English and British English unless you've grown up watching Carry On movies, right? Uh, every Christmas that just brings different different meaning to words. But also, when you look at all of the other cultures around the world who learn English. Um, I, I, I've worked in, in Norway, I've worked in Sweden, I've worked in uh, a little bit in Germany, and everywhere I go, um, people are very good at English, often better than most people in the UK. Um, but 
different words have different meanings. And if in their language, the words have different meanings, it's very difficult to translate into yeah. English. The, the specific one I always think of, especially when I'm, when I'm teaching Scrum and I'm having to explain, is I'm try, trying to, to get across the difference between accountability and responsibility. That is often a very um, difficult translation that's exercise. Very difficult because in many languages, accountability and responsibility in English translates to the same word in their language. But when you explain what you mean by accountability or mean by responsibility, they go, oh, that one's this other word that we hardly ever use anymore, but it's definitely different. Yeah. And that, that's where the translators perhaps got it wrong years ago, um, and it just sticks. So you have to try and explain concepts like that. Even, even in native English-speaking audiences, countries, we find the words responsible and accountable used interchangeably, yeah. even though there's a, a completely different thing. Yeah, even going back old school and looking at a racing matrix, many times you have a look at a racing matrix and one column's a you know, just a, a copy of the previous one. Um, and it's, it's tricky. Um, well, and that's I, usually, I usually say you can, you can delegate responsibility, but you can't delegate accountability. Yeah. That's a great one. I'm going to steal that. <laughs> that's, that's the easy way <laughs> for years of trying to explain the different things. You can't delegate accountability. It's you. Yeah. Yeah. Talk to anybody else. Yeah, the buck stops here. Somebody else might have done the work and messed it up, but who's accountable? Well, you are. Yeah. You made them responsible, but you're accountable. And the the metaphor I often use for that is if um, you have somebody do some, say your your car needs to be roadworthy, you'll take it to a mechanic to do the work on the car. Yep. As soon as you drive the car, you are accountable for driving a roadworthy vehicle. Yep. And another good one is your accountant. Your accountant builds your accounts. They're responsible for doing your they're accounts. Responsible for building your accounts, but they're not accountable. You still sign your accounts for your company and submit them to the Inland Revenue or the, the tax office. And if it's wrong, it's not your accountant's fault. It's yours. Yeah. And that's and, the reason you put your autograph on it, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. But that that I I think that that one's great because it, it's a it's a common thing that's actually quite easy to explain the difference if you take a little bit of time just to do it up front so that people don't get don't get confused right away. It's really hard to fix if you let people think it for two days and then you fix it at the end, right? Yeah. You can fix it the first time you mention it, you've got to explain the difference. And then, then it's easy. But there are loads of other things that slip through the cracks. Um, I spend I spend lots, especially analogies. Oh my goodness me, uh, analogies and 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 sayings, idioms. Are they called idioms? Sayings. The thing. Yeah, yeah. So there are a, a number. Just because we're both PSTs, there are a number of those in the Scrum training material. And I always have to explain them because I am almost never teaching a class with just British and American people in it. There's always people from other countries. And when it says in the Scrum Guide, oh, this is a, this is a boilerplate example of something, they're all like, what the hell does boilerplate mean? Because it's not an idiom in their country. Yeah. And even... even um, even simple ones. So my, my, my favorite, this, my two favorite ones, Simon. Um, first one is uh, you've got egg on your face. Yeah. Uh, you look like you've got egg on your face in, in British English means you've done something stupid. I think it translates to American English as well. And if, yeah. you, go to, if you go to Africa and you go to uh, um, other India, they get that relationship as well. All the, all the, yeah. all the, the, the ex-colonies, right? They get that. Um, but if you go to Norway, they're like, what the hell are you talking about? Why would you have egg on your face? Right. And when, but you, when you explain the idiom, they're like, oh, you've caught your beard in the mailbox. Cause that's their version of the yeah. same thing. You look like you've caught your beard in the mailbox. 
Um, and but these types of things are really important to learn if you're dealing with people that in, in a multicultural environment. And it's really much, much, much more common these days to deal with people in a multicultural environment. Yeah, as uh, <laughs> many years ago, I was doing some training in India. Uh, we referred to the person, the, the DevOps engineer, we used to call them the build monkey. That was the nickname we gave them. Okay. So I was running, running a session, a workshop. Uh, the chap who looked after the, the DevOps for this particular piece, really good engineer. Um, I called him Bill Monkey and the whole room went deathly quiet. You said and something I was like, I, I, I looked around and I said, I, I've just offended. I've, I've said something really terrible there, haven't I? I've, I've crossed the line. And they're like, yeah, the monkey is not a well-revered animal in this neck of the woods. Like, they didn't use the term neck of the woods either, you know. In, yeah. in, there we go. Um, in this area, you know, the, the monkey's not a revered animal, so it's derogatory to call someone a monkey. Um, yep. it, it's, it's uh, yeah, it's, it's diminutive, it's dismissive, it's, it's really, really negative. So I, you've just got to own it and apologize and say, oh, look, really, sorry, over. It's just a, a catchphrase we use, you know, in my team back in the UK. And so we have to be careful about our, our slang, I suppose. And uh, yeah. you know, being as being Australian, there's um, there's so much like Australian speak in slang, uh, yeah. vernacular slang, rhyming slang, missing words, shortening, lengthening words, putting profanity in, and that's a very one. I've, I've got to be very careful. You go to America, you have to be so careful because profanity, of, even though what in the UK would be deemed mild, is deemed exceptionally offensive. I. My first ever gig when I came back from the US, because I lived there for three years, um, was with a company called DFDS, which is a shipping company. And I was in their their office, which was on site at one of their, you know, it was, basically it was a bunch of porter cabins stacked on top of each other at a shipping location. And that's where the IT team was. That's where we were running the training, just in the main room. And I heard more swearing in the first 10 minutes in that office than I'd heard in three years living in the US. And it was so refreshing. <laughs> <laughs> that that was that but you're 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 absolutely right. I think I think as as foreigners in the US, we do get away with a lot more than a US local would be able to do. Um, and they 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 do respect that culturally, but there are still certain words that are completely and utterly off bounds in the US, which are considered a term of endearment in Glasgow, right? So you've just got to be you got to be yeah you've just got to be conscious of of who your audience is, what the boundaries are in your audience. It depends on your I have I have multiple customers, and some of my customers in the US. Uh, are in New York and you'll get on a call and there'll be more F's than you can possibly imagine. Or it could be West Coast and everything's persona non grata, right? You can't use any form of of difficult language. A anything difficult is 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 gets you in trouble. Yeah, well, so, I, I, I need to work on it because I, I think using profanity is just verbal linguistic laziness. Um, it's just easy to intensify just by dropping Billy profanity. Connolly would disagree. Billy Connolly would disagree. He's a stand-up comic, right? He's not a professional working with organisations. Sure, I, I think I think yeah, it's definitely it's definitely an important thing. I, I don't have such a hard time with it. I think as as you put yourself through, like I don't mind a little bit of swearing as long as it's as long as it's not abusive, right? At people, as long as it's at things. Um, then, then, then I'm cool. That's a bit of a shit situation. Is okay. You're a shit. Is not okay, right? That that, that type of distinction, I'm 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 generally fine with. Um, but yeah, it's re culturally as well. Different cultures, Americans especially, don't like uh, uh, profanity. It's their background, right? It's historical reasons for that. Um, 
yeah, and so I, I think where we're circling around is the the difference between language based the the context and the culture. We have to be mindful of that, um, yep. which means we need to be. I, I think there's a wonderful thing about English. English wielded well and articulately has a degree of accuracy and precision when used well. Which um, is why it's a technical language, right? In many places in the world. Yeah. Is it what's uh, a fish called Wanda, what do you say? Yeah, you know, you use English for your lawyer. You know, because and I suppose that's the thing, is that uh, when we use English precisely using accurate jargon, correct keywords that are clearly defined and when are understood, it, it becomes as as uh, incisive as a scalpel. And I suppose that's my thing with profanity. Um, it, it, it takes that scalpel and just turns it into an instrument of blunt force trauma. <laughs> it dulls the edge. And I think that that is ultimately why words matter. Right? That's, that's why it matters. So what's, if there's one thing we can do to help ourselves and everyone else, what's, what's an invitation you'd offer to folks who are listening to help their words matter more? Don't be afraid to ask people what they mean. If you don't understand something somebody said, either because you misheard it or because it's a piece of jargon that you've not heard before, just ask. Even That's if it's one. asking chat, right, on the side, and hopefully somebody will answer on the side without disrupting the, the, the speaker or the, the process, make a list. I do that. I have I have a, a, a I make a list. With, oh, make a list when I'm working with customers, and then I I fire off an email to somebody and say, "What do these things mean? I don't know what these things." And sometimes they'll come back with, "I know this one, this one, and this one, but I have no idea what that one is either." Right? I've heard it, but I don't know what it is. And that that that's what to do. So ask, just ask. What about you, Simon? Mine would be, it, similar to that one, is to play back what I heard you say was what I hit, what I think you mean was this and paraphrase what the person has said in slightly different words to make sure that you have achieved a common understanding. And so between asking if there's a reserved word or a, a term that you've never heard before and playing back, I think we can help our words matter more, right? I agree. Well, I think that's all we've got time for today. Uh, yeah, so a, I thank really you very enjoyed much the conversation, listening. Simon. No, always enjoy the conversations. Uh, if you've liked the conversation, please like and subscribe. Ask us questions. What do you want us to uh, witter on about next? Uh, if you don't know what witter means, it means to talk at length or in detail, sometimes straying from the topic back and forth, a bit like the discussions we're having yeah please reach out to us use the social media channels uh let us know give us feedback we love that stuff and we look forward to you know talking again on the next episode of agile actually thank you so much thank thanks, you Martin. all thanks